five kernels of Thanksgiving corn. I thought, five kernels of uh, Thanksgiving corn. Psalms 103. Let me share it with you. Psalms 103, one, uh, verse 1 through about verse 13. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy... You can stand. Again, I, I, I apologize to you. Let me start over. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is re renewed like the eagles. The Lord, the Lord works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord also has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows how we are made. He remembers that we are dust. As for mortals, their days are like grass. They flourish like the flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it's gone. And its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. On those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. To those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, obedient to his spoken word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers that do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his, dom of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. God. Amen. You can be seated. You may or may not be wondering, so uh, five kernels of uh, Thanksgiving corn? Help me. Okay. In, in just a few days, we will be given the privilege once again. I remind you, it's not an entitlement. It's a privilege. We will be given the privilege once again in whatever tradition you do and in whatever way your family chooses to honor those traditions, we'll have Thanksgiving. And I know... If I ask most people, so, what are you going to do Thanksgiving? Going to watch the game? What else? Going to eat? What else? Well, that's a good question. It's an okay response, but it's, a, uh, it's only that. I would hope, again, I would hope, that when we gather at that table and we look down at the feast that has been prepared for us by others, something of Thanksgiving overwhelms us. And we take just a moment not to run through the words of grace, but to say grace and say thank you. Because I remind you again, you didn't raise the bird. You didn't grow the corn. Most of us didn't. You didn't do anything. We went to a store, we went somewhere, and we, we bought it and we purchased it. We brought it home. We didn't, we, didn't, we didn't put down the pipe or run the electrical wires that brought to our homes those things that allowed us that privilege. We didn't do anything. And so when we stand there that day and we look down at that feast prepared for us by others, it ought to be that we are overwhelmed with that sense of gratitude and God's generosity and we say thank you. It ought to be that when we look around and we see our moms and our dads, we see our sisters and our brothers, we see our baby girls and our baby boys. We look and we see them and we see how good God has been to us. I'd remind you, doesn't God say that children are a gift from God? And blessed be the man who has his quiver full. It ought to be that when we look not just down but around, we are reminded that those who are there that day to celebrate with us Thanksgiving 
We ought to be thankful, shouldn't we? It ought to be that as we go forth and we realize, if you can see the game, you ought to be thankful. If you can hear the game, you ought to be thankful. If you can control the knobs, I, I, I know, uh, you know, I'm not that old, but I know when I'm having a bad day because, can, can you guys do the Weblo thing? Can y'all do that? Can y'all do that? I can't. When I'm having a bad day, I can't get my hands together. My hands are arthritis and other things have taken that ability away from me. So my, I hurt a lot. You guys who have arthritis, y'all hurt? Okay. So I hurt a lot, but I'm glad I got hands. My feet hurt. I have gout, <laughs> but I'm glad I got feet. And so as I look around and I think about how good I am, how good God has been to me, how blessed I am and how blessed we are, I hope it is with me and with you and with us and with others that we will say, thank you. I'd remind you nearly 300-something years ago, going on, what, 1620, 1618, 1920 in that area, when, the, when our founding fathers hit the shores of America and they had that first Thanksgiving around 1621, how it must have been that as they looked out there, it wasn't always a good thing. How it was that after that first brutal winter, and, we're, you know, we, we, we read the stories, and I would remind you, the, the stories that our kids and grandkids are told are not the ones we were told, and that's sad because they're rewriting history. Because of political agendas, because of just academic insensitivity, and because of all those little nuances that bleed into the story, our kids, very few, unless you have the gumption and the guts to do it, they're not being told the whole story because of so many reasons. But when I was a young one in school, we were told and participated in those Thanksgiving stories that after that brutal first winter, that they, they had more graves than those that could fill them. You know what I'm saying? That over, over half of those people that landed in America died that, that first winter. Died. And then the ship that came that was to resupply those, those brothers and sisters. They had 35 more mouths to feed and no provisions to share. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine looking out with hope-filled expectations to see these ships anchored off of your, your harbor? To believe that they're going to bring and they're going to resupply you and you're going to be able to eat for the first time in months. They ha maybe have a meal. And to look out and see these, these landing crafts hitting the shore and they're filled with people, expectant people, happy people, hopeful people, believing that they've finally made it to the promised land, only to look around and see the graves around the community, only to see these emaciated, gaunt figures staggering towards the shoreline, only seeing that the only thing holding them up is the hand of God and faith in the Almighty. Can you imagine how it must have been that day, William Brewster, the governor of the colony, looked down at a cup of cold water, a cup of cold water and a plate of clams, and he said, thanks and thanksgiving to God for the abundance of the sea and treasures hid in the sand. Come on. <laughs> Standing there looking around that table and having nothing more to eat than a cup of cold water and, a, and, and clams? And it, that wasn't the worst of it. It had gotten so bad at one point in their journey that at one point in their journey, all they had was water and five kernels of corn per person per day. Did you hear me? <laughs> All they had, all they had was a cup of water and five kernels of corn per person per day. After Thanksgiving, when things got a whole lot better, you know what they did? They, they brought into their Thanksgiving tradition celebration. Do you know what they did first before they did anything else? They set the table. And they set a place at an, an, an empty place at the table. And in front of that empty chair, symbolizing those many who had died, who had paid the ultimate sacrifice for their children and for others to have the privilege of worshiping and living in this great and glorious land as they saw it. They would set the empty chair and a plate in front of that chair. And in front of that, they would put a cup of cold water and five kernels 
of thanksgiving corn. I like that. I like that. And the tradition was that the, the, the head of the household, the father, the patriarch, if he was living, or the matriarch, if not, would reach over and pick up a kernel of Thanksgiving corn and lift it up and rehearse the story of their journey and rehearse the story of their history and maybe looking at or maybe not at the grave and the graveyard of those who had died that first brutal winter and afterwards. And they would lift that kernel up and they would say a prayer to Almighty God. Thank you. Thank you for the abundance of the seed. Thank you for the treasures hidden in the sand. Thank you for our brothers that came and saved us. Thank you for those that have done for whatever. And so with that being said, let me lift up this morning uh, uh, some thoughts out of, uh, out of Psalms 103. If, if it was my privilege to have before me this day, not just a cup of cold water, but a, a plate and upon that plate, five kernels of Thanksgiving corn. Let me draw from Psalms 103, five kernels of Thanksgiving. The first one I see in verse 3 is the kernel of forgiveness. It says that God forgives all our sins. You read that? God forgives all our sins. Have you ever needed to be forgiven? I'm just talking to you. Have you ever done anything wrong? Come on now. Have you ever just really messed up? I'm talking about really messed up. No, no, I'm really, I mean, really messed up. Have you ever done that? And have you ever, you, you feel the guilt and the shame associated with that mess up? You know what I'm saying? You remember those days? You remember how bad you felt and you remember looking to the face of those whom you've harmed and those whom you've hurt? You remember the look in their eyes and the feeling upon your soul? You know how bad that feels? And have you had that person, because of their great grace, have you had that person look you in the eye and say to you, I forgive you. Have you, when you ask forgiveness, have been the recipient of that amazing gift and have because, and it's not on them, it's on you. I know I've hurt people and you have too. I know I've done wrong, and you have too. And I know how that feels, and you do too. And I know I've asked forgiveness, and you have too. And what a gift it is when you look at that one whom you harm, and you say, I'm sorry, would you forgive me? And have that person say in response, of course. <laughs> how can I not forgive you? Remember what the Bible says? To forgive others as Christ has forgiven us because of Jesus Christ who died on Calvary's cross for us. And so how can it not be? How can it not be that when we seek and when we need, we receive? And so this verse re reminds us of this kernel of Thanksgiving corn. God forgives us all our sins. Hallelujah. Not some of them, not the slight ones, not the, 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 the little bitty thing. God forgives us all our sins, all our iniquities. And we say this, how, how can that be? How can this promise of the Father be because of the provisions of the Son? Let me give you a picture. It's the picture of, of, of God looking at us. And this is the word picture given to us. God sees us and our sins. But then he sees Jesus and the price paid. And it's the idea of looking at us and our sin looking at Jesus and what he did and doing this to it. Walking away from it. Because the price that was paid was so great that our sins pale in comparison to that gift of God. Amen? And when God sees what Jesus did to set us free, when God sees that Jesus the Son willingly died, willingly suffered, bled, and died to set us free, to give us the privilege of forgiving and being forgiven, when God the Father sees the provision made by God the Son, the promise of the Father to, to those of that day, to we of this day is, I forgive. Thank God. Thank God for Jesus and for forgiveness. Thank God that he can forgive our sins. Thank God he can forgive our mistakes. Thank God he's a God of generosity, a God of grace, a God of mercy, a God of, for, of forgiving. Thank God. Not only that, if I could reach into the plate and grab another one, it would be a kernel of redemption. Look at verse 4. 
He redeems our life from destruction. What, what does it mean to be redeemed? I mean, we, 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 we talk about God's redeemed us and all that. What does it mean? Well, it has, it has at least two or three meanings that, that, that has some relevance to this day. If we've been redeemed, a price has been paid for that redemption. We go, I, I've asked you guys, would y'all mind say, you know, sending in your Coke rewards for Aaron because he redeems those for tennis shoes and all that. So you guys are participating in helping us help our son because with his multiple sclerosis, he, he, he hadn't got a job, so he wants at Christmas time and birthday time to, to give to his brothers and sisters. And so what he does is he cashes in all of his Coke rewards. He can get stuff for his brothers and sisters. And so when he does that, he redeems those rewards. What did he do? In order to get something, he had to give something. A price has been paid for, for God to redeem us, for God to reclaim us, for God to reown us, for God to take us back. Something had to be paid. Jesus did. It also has the idea of being removed from circulation, the slave market. It means in that day that these guys would all gather together and the master or someone would come up and they would start bidding it and the price would be paid. And when the price would be paid, the, the one who had ownership would unlock the chains and set them free and turn the reins over to the new master. That's what Jesus did and does. At Calvary's crossbars, Jesus suffered, bled, and died. And the master, Satan, who had us shackled in shame and sin and all of that, he turned the reins and he turned the chains over to Jesus. And Jesus, because of his great love and Jesus, because of his great, awesome generosity, he reached up and set us free. He unlocked the chains that bind us. He unlocked the chains and the shackles that hold us captive in captivity. And he set us free. We've been redeemed. Hallelujah. Redeemed. Hebrews says that, we, that he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God through him. Hebrews also says it's not by, uh, it's not by corruptible sayings of silver and gold, but by his own blood that he has redeemed us. And so in this idea of being redeemed, we've been set free. In this idea of being redeemed, we have been brought and bought out of the slave market, placed into uh, the ownership of a new master, Jesus. And he didn't ask us anything we can't. He only asked us of what we could and what we should. To give ourselves willingly and sacrificially in service of him and others because of what he did for us. And so if I could reach into the plate and give a kernel of forgiveness and a kernel of redemption and then a kernel of healing. He heals all our diseases. You know, I, I, I've struggled with that because I, I, in 30 years of ministry and 50-something years of life, I've seen a lot of people die and hurt. And so when I try to reconcile what it says here with life experience, I'm confused. What does it mean he heals all our diseases? We pray God deliver them, God heal them, and God doesn't. We get angry at God, don't we? Well, I asked God to heal my cancer, and he didn't do it. That means God didn't listen. Yes, God does. We have been sold a bill of goods. There are exceptions to every rule, I promise you. But the Bible doesn't promise us that we can name it, claim it, and God does it. That's not in the Bible. God does not tell us just because we believe that's enough. He didn't say that. He has the ability, and he might, he might very well heal you. He might. You can ask. I do. Because if I don't ask, I don't get. But if I do ask, it's still on God, not on me. And so it, there's a part of that, yeah, it may be physical. I don't think so. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. When you're broken and you're seeking healing, what does it do to you? Let me help. Our problem is we're so pride-filled, we don't ask God anything. We think we can do it all by ourselves. But when you lose your health, I guarantee you, when you lose your health and you lose your hope in your health, you'll go down quick. And when you're, you're down as far as you can go, you've got no place to look but up. When you look up, I hope you're looking in the eyes of Jesus. When you're looking up and you're reaching out and you're saying, God, help me. God, heal me. You know what that does? It places you down in, 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 a, in a state of dependency that you've got to believe in God. You've got to reach out. You've got to put yourself down and reach up and reach out to Him. And when we do that, it does something inside of us. Because we receive the gifts of God, not healing primarily, though He might. We receive, the, we receive the gift of His love, the gift of His presence, the gift of His power, the gift of, of wholeness inside. We've got to get right inside before we can ever be better outside. Does that make sense? If we're not healed inside, we can't help outside. If we get healed and whole inside, we can do anything outside, even in broken bodies. Let me tell you something. I've seen a lot of broken people who, who whose the Spirit of God resonates with. You know what I mean? 
I've seen some blinded saints that can see better than I. I've seen some legless saints that have a closer walk with Jesus than I might ever have. You know why? Because they've been in the valley. And in the valley they found Jesus. And in the valley they found the power of God and the presence of God. And so when he heals our diseases, it's not always physical. It may be that he heals emotional and spiritual needs and then he works outward. Not only that. If I could reach in there and pull out another kernel, it would be God's love and compassion. He says, as a father pities his children, so God pities us. Do you parents know what that says? I know that you do. There's a lot of times when my babies and I am absolutely frustrated at them, and they'll start crying, <laughs> or they'll start acting out. And something inside of me, something way down deep inside of me, it begins to bubble up inside of me, and it says, they're just acting out, they're just being babies, they're just being children, they can't help themselves. And that thing called compassion that bubbles up, it makes me respond in love. And I do what I need to do. Not what they want, but what I need to. That's what God does. God looks down at us and he sees how weak and fragile we are. And he sees our need and God responds to what we need, not what we want. God responds to what we need in him and need in spite of ourselves. And so when God does that, he reaches out in love and compassion. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Hallelujah. And so as I think about love, it's a lot of love. That here in his love, not that God loved us, but not that we loved him, but that he loved us and gave his son to be a propitiation for our sins. That Jesus Christ suffered, bled, and died to set us free. And in that, in that selfless sacrifice, we have everything we could ever hope for, more than we'll ever need. And it's found all because of Jesus. In this plate in front of us, we will find forgiveness and redemption and healing and love and compassion and also satisfaction and renewal. He satisfies our soul with good. I'm just guessing. I'm, I'm just guessing. But I would bet you that one response that we'll all have Thanksgiving Day after dinner is, whew, I'm full. I'm just thinking. I'm just thinking that we'll get off the table and we'll, we'll hold our stomach and we'll stagger to a chair or somewhere and settle down because I'm satisfied. You know what Jesus says, what God says in these words? God the Father so loves us, and his gift to us is he can satisfy your soul. He can satisfy the deepest longings of your soul. He can look into the cracks and crevices, into the shadows of our soul. He can see the deepest needs and the, and the darkest regrets. He can see all those things that bind us and all those things that mess with us, all those things that hurt us. He can see all that stuff, and in spite of all that stuff, he can reach through the filth and the, and the muck and the mire, and he can reach down to the core of where we are, and he can give us himself, and he can give us what we need, and, and giving himself to us and, 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 and expressing that love and compassion to us as a father does to his children. And all that God does and in response to that, it satisfies our soul. There's a lot of things I won't ever have, but I have Jesus. Amen? I won't live in a mansion. I don't care. <laughs> I'll live in what God gives me and be satisfied. Isn't that what Paul says? I've learned in whatever state I'm in to be content. I've learned how to, be, uh, how to be lifted up, and I've learned how to be knocked down. And everything and all things, I've learned above everything and all things, I've learned this one thing, to be content. Because whatever it is I've got, glory be to God, I've got it. And so God wishes to give us healing and forgiveness and mercy and love and passion, grace and generosity. So maybe this day when you have Thanksgiving, maybe it, it might not be a bad thing. Put a plate at the table and put on it five kernels of Thanksgiving corn. And maybe it wouldn't be a bad thing as you drink that cup of cool water and you're reminded of where we come from and where God wants to bring us. That as you lift those kernels up, that God might impress upon you the spirit of thanks and thanksgiving. I pray for us, for me, and for others. Amen and amen.